So, Dr. Vincent Smith, welcome to UNIS W Australia, and thank you for your time for uh, allowing us to interview you here mm -hmm. with the Physics Outreach Unit. So, if you can give us a brief background about what inspired you to become a particle physicist. That's actually a, a difficult question, um, because uh, in my final year as an undergraduate, I, I didn't really know where to go, even whether to continue in research or perhaps get a job in industry. Um, so actually, I had a job in industry lined up as a <laughs> to fall back. In those days, that was uh, not as difficult as now. Um, but I, I visited Bristol University and was taken around the department, shown all the interesting things going on. But the one that attracted me the most um, was particle physics. Um, the head of the group at the time was a wild Australian, actually, oh, right. a, a Greek Australian, John Malos. Uh, and uh, he had lots of up-to-date equipment and uh, it really uh, excited me. Not, not so much the topic, but j just doing it, doing the physics. Um, so I signed up for that um, and uh, when I got my degree I was able to uh, uh, join the group. Um, we worked on an accelerator in England, in the UK, for my PhD um, in Oxfordshire. Um, place called the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory um, and uh, later on um, moved to CERN um, uh, when the, f the field really needed the higher energies available at CERN. What decade was this? Um, I started my PhD in 65, I got it in um, uh, January 69, yeah. yes, um, but uh, Really, the, the, the field advanced such that the, the whole UK involvement um, focused more and more on CERN. There were still some experiments back in the UK, but uh, we, we moved to CERN, did a, a series of experiments there. Um, How big was the collider back then? Um, we, my very first experiment was on um, the, the um, what was it called, the intersecting storage rings, um, which was a proton-proton collider. Just I guess for the, for the audience, can yeah. you describe what a, an accelerator or a particle accelerator oh. is and what, it, what we intend to provide? Okay. Is, like, um, what we do is we give lots and lots of energy to uh, particles, stable particles like protons or electrons usually, um, antiprotons or anti-electrons uh, also uh, will do, um, and we um, put oscillating electric fields to give them lots and lots of kinetic energy. And then uh, we either smash them into a, a fixed target, uh, a metal target, or sometimes liquid hydrogen. In fact, most of my career was in fixed target physics. But you get more energy available for making exciting new particles if you collide the particles together. And actually, that was what happened in this intersecting storage rings. Um, maximum energy of about 30 GeV, so 30 times the rest energy of the proton uh, in each beam. Um, but then after, um, I suppose, uh, 10 or 12 years at CERN, um, I moved to Fermilab in, near Chicago in the United oh, right. States and did a, a series of experiments there in the 1990s, um, coming back to CERN with the beginning of the Large Hadron Collider um, in, the, well, the, the planning for it and the design and construction and testing of the experiment um, in the early 2000s. And, uh, I think Switch On was uh, 2000 and 2009, perhaps. We, as you probably remember, we had a false start. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, can you talk us through that? Because I remember seeing a little video uh, online about mm. you explaining what actually went wrong. Okay. Well, not totally catastrophic, right. of course, but <laughs> no black holes yeah. were opened right. up or anything right. like that. Well, you need to know that in order to guide the particles around this large ring, um, 27 kilometers uh, in circumference, both clockwise and anti-clockwise, they're going at a very, very high energy and they need a very, very strong magnetic field to guide them round. The energy comes from an oscillating electric field, but they're guided round by these very strong magnets. And the magnets uh, are electromagnets and they have currents of up to 13,000 amperes, which means you can't wind the coils out of copper or aluminium, it would just melt. What we use is a, a special alloy of niobium and titanium cooled to just four degrees, no, sorry, to just 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. 
cooled to 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. So a superconductor. A superconductor. So it has absolutely zero resistance, so it can carry those very high currents uh, without any, uh, any resistance, any dual heating. Um, but that means you have to cool them, and that needs liquid helium at these very, very low temperatures. Now, when you first turn on a superconductor and cool it down, increase the current, increase the magnetic field, it reaches a point, because the magnetic field is, is not completely uniform, it reaches a point where s a part of it exceeds the magnetic field for superconductivity. Yeah. It becomes normal conducting, it has resistance, and so it develops heat, and it boils away the helium. Now, we call that a quench, because it's just like putting a red-hot piece of metal into water. Yeah. This is still very, very low temperatures, 10 degrees, perhaps, above absolute zero. Um, but if you do that a, a number of times, 10 or a dozen times, it works its way up to the design uh, magnetic field. Yeah. Now, we were in a hurry to put the LHC together, and so not all of the magnets had had that, um, those series of steps of quenches, training as we call it. They weren't all trained to the uh, right magnetic field. And so there was a, a small problem. They had to replace a transformer. Um, this was about uh, two weeks after they'd turned it on. They had to replace a transformer. So they knew there would be no beam for 48 hours. So they took the opportunity to train this section of magnets up to nearer to the operating value. And uh, they had a quench, which was part of the, uh, uh, the normal um, operation of, of training the magnets. But unfortunately, because you have to discharge all of the energy stored in the magnetic field, and that's usually done by carrying the current into external resistors, which heat up and discharge the energy. In this case, the electrical contact was faulty. And so the quench boiled away the helium. Um, the, the, the stored energy in each magnet is about the same as two kilograms of TNT. So it, it didn't blow up the magnet in that sense, but it certainly boiled away in a flash all of this, uh, all of the helium in the magnet. Um, so it filled the tunnel to an overpressure of four atmospheres, blew the doors off their hinges, blew the magnets off the stands. It, people said it was like a railway accident, all of these magnets higgledy-piggledy for um, uh, 300 meters or so along the length of the tunnel. So that took a long time to recover. I think it was 14 months. And obviously, no one was present in the tunnel. No one was present. You wouldn't be in there when you were t uh, training the magnets anyway. Um, but so, it, so we never called it an accident. <laughs> Nobody was injured. Yeah. Um, the CERN management called it an incident. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but more recently, the new CERN management just called it an electrical fault. Oh. But it was a rather yeah. serious yeah. electrical yes. fault. It set you back how long? How about, about 14 yeah. months. 14 months. Which, which was actually very convenient for that, us on the experiments, because although, obviously, politically, we had to say we were ready for turn on, um, and, and we were ready, we would, we would have taken some good data, um, but we were even more ready 14 months later. <laughs> so I take it your part of the research is not actually building the collider, it's more no, actually no. analysing the data that comes well, out. Well, um, my, my contribution was mostly to um, uh, testing, uh, installing and testing again a small part of the CMS detector, one of the big detectors yeah. on the LHC. CMS stands for? CMS stands for Compact Muon Solenoid. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, because there were two major... Two ma A Atlas and CMS were the two that discovered the Higgs boson. Yeah. Um, and I, I was a, a small part, one of about 3,000 members of the CMS collaboration. It, it, it is an enormous detector, so it needs a very large number of people um, to keep it going and to analyse the data and so on. So, the Higgs boson, why is it so important for particle physicists to actually find this particular particle? We have what we call the standard model of particle yeah. physics, which ex explains all of the observations we've made so far. But there was one missing piece, and this missing piece had been missing for nearly 50 years. A group of theoreticians um, 50 years ago um, were worried about how particles gain their mass. Um, it'll take a long time to go into the details, but essentially, um, the interactions between particles are much easier to understand if they're massless. Mm. But that would mean, because the photon is massless and travels at the speed of light, 
all the particles would be massless and travel at the speed of light. So they'd always be zipping about the universe, never coming together to make atoms and molecules, stars and planets, trees and people. So mass is very, very important. And the mechanism for giving mass to the particles was proposed by uh, a, gr a group of uh, six theoretical physicists um, back in uh, 50 years ago. The idea is that all of what we think of as empty space, the entire universe, is filled with a field. And as the particles move through this field, they interact with it, and that gives them inertia, gives them mass. The more strongly they interact with the field, the more mass they have. So the really massive particles must interact uh, very strongly. Um, one of the um, theoreticians went just a little bit further and he said that just like the electromagnetic field has particles associated with it, photons, and the other f fields that we've discovered also have particles associated with them, this field should have particles associated with it. Um, and his name was Peter Higgs, and so the, the particles, the Higgs bosons, of this uh, mass-generating field um, have been named after him. Unfortunately, the theory didn't say how strongly it interacts with itself, and therefore what mass it has. Uh, okay. So, as we've, over the last 50 years, as we've had higher and higher energies available, as new accelerators come on stream, we've been looking for the Higgs boson. But it wasn't until finally, with the extremely high energies of the Large Hadron Collider, um, that we actually had enough energy to, to produce these particles, observe their decays, measure the mass, and, so and look at the other properties. Yeah, so if you observe the energy signature of the Higgs boson, you effectively confirm the idea of this mm. Higgs field as well. We, we, we know it will decay. I mean, it's very, very short-lived. You never actually see the Higgs particle itself. You only see the daughter particles from its, oh, from its break up. Can you explain that process and why, I guess what I'm trying to get at is um, the stati uh, statistical significance of doing lots and lots of these collisions to actually confirm. Right. That, indeed, the we, we collide our particles 40 million times a second. But we're only going to make a Higgs boson perhaps once a fortnight. It's an extremely rare reaction. Most of the time when you collide protons with protons, it's just a glancing collision. They pass by each other and the debris goes close to the beam line. What you need is a very head-on collision. And of course, protons aren't elementary. They're made of quarks held together by gluons. So you want a head-on collision with lots of energy between two quarks or between two gluons to have a chance of making the Higgs boson. If you make the Higgs boson, as I say, it, it will be very, very short-lived. It won't even get out of the uh, vacuum pipe where the collision takes place. Um, it'll immediately break up into other particles. And we've got a range of what we call final states um, four electrons or four muons, like heavy electrons. Um, two gamma rays is an interesting um, uh, final state. So the protons collide, two very high energy gamma rays come out. If you measure the direction and the energy of the gamma rays, you can calculate what was the mass or the energy of the parent particle. So, of course, most of the time, Two particles collide, two quarks collide, let's say, and produce a photon. Two other quarks collide and produce a photon. So the two photons have nothing to do with each other, but we calculate the mass nevertheless, and because it's random, we have a, a, a range of energies. But if the Higgs was produced, producing these two gamma rays, that will be a specific energy, the mass of the Higgs particle. So what we get is a curve that goes rapidly down as you go to higher and higher energies or masses, but there's this little pimple on it which represents the Higgs boson. And what energy is the...? Uh, 125 times the mass of the proton, roughly, 125 GeV. Now, if you see a little pimple, because as I said, what we call this background, two independent gammas, this, this, this background can have en any energy you like, and it's random, so there will be fluctuations up and down. So if you see a little bump, you don't know for sure whether you've got a Higgs boson or whether it's just one of these fluctuations. You have to go on until the statistical significance of the bump is sufficient for um, the journals to publish your results. And the journals had said before we started, we're not going to accept your paper unless you have a significance of six standard deviations. That's about one chance in 10 million that it's just a fluctuation. Uh, now, 
after, I suppose it was a, a year or so of running, we did have a bump, but it wasn't of sufficient statistical significance. A colleague calculated it was equivalent to being given a coin to test, and you flip the coin, and you get eight heads in a row. Now, that's pretty suspicious, but could be just random. Yeah. That's the state we were in. Now, by July 2012, um, we had a sufficiently large bump that it was equivalent to 20 heads in a row. Still could be random, but we were pretty sure the journals accepted this, and we actually presented the data at a conference here in Melbourne um, in July 2012, Particle Physics Conference. So we see it not only in the gamma-gamma um, decay, but we also see it in four electrons, four muons. Our um, friendly competitors, uh, Atlas, also see it at about the same energy, pretty much the same energy. So it, 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 we're reasonably confident there's something there, yeah. but is it exactly what was predicted by Peter Higgs? Mm. That's one of the things we're going on measuring. Oh, now still. Right. Now, we have already measured um, its angular momentum, its spin, mm -hmm. and that's consistent with the, the, the prediction. It actually has zero angular momentum. Um, but we have to measure its other properties in detail, so when the Large Hadron Collider comes back on in spring of next year, 2015, mm. we will be studying it in much more detail. I was going to ask, what is the likelihood of actually another collision or another particle exhibiting the same energy signature? Well, there are a number of theoretical predictions of what we call beyond the standard model. Oh, okay. We know the standard model isn't the final answer, there are some inconsistencies in it, but which way to go to uh, get the physics from that? So it could be that this is not the Higgs boson, but a Higgs boson, oh, right. right? There could be a number of others at different masses, mm. um, but uh, less um, rarer to make and therefore we would need now we're going to have higher energy and higher intensity in 2015 so as well as exploring the bump we have we'll be on the lookout for other bumps so bigger and better hopefully gets a better exactly. result yes <laughs> yes excellent yeah well that's a quite a significant find and hopefully we'll get more out of that now coming back to why you're actually here in Australia mm -hmm. of all places because you've come all the way right. from England to here um, and you're now teaching uh, one of our first year undergraduate courses. So uh, no, a third, third year course. Oh, third, third year course. Sorry, I, I'm a sex. So I, undergraduate I, physics. I taught, I taught a first year course in the summer semester, oh, and now, okay. it's, now it's a third year so course. So you just yeah. generally teach undergraduate physics here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I take it you've been mainly an experimentalist physicist, but how did you get involved in teaching? Oh, I, all my career I've been uh, enjoying both. Um, I, I've always said I, I know colleagues who only teach and I know colleagues who only research and I'm delighted to be able to do both yeah. because actually they, they feed on each other. Yeah. By being at the basis of your, um, uh, of your subject, by teaching it, that is very, very helpful in your research and also you can use examples from research in your teaching. So, so the, the two mesh together extremely well. I've, I've always in my mind, that. you're the ultimate science, uh, science communicator in, oh. in that sense, because I think scientists should actually communicate their ideas, but mm. doing it well, that's another story. Mm. <laughs> um, but if you have that experience, that's fantastic. So, yeah. But also for your effort, efforts, you received the Order of the British Empire, is that correct? A member of the Order oh, of British member, Empire, yes. MBE, yes. MBE, yeah. well, congratulations for, on for, that. Uh, I was delighted that it said, for services to physics. All oh, right. Uh, right. You know, there, 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 the other people get them for services to the community and so on and so forth, but I, I was very pleased that mine was so... Oh, uh, um, and through all this sort of outreach and communications, you've actually given me a couple of public talks in the last year, indeed, on the Large Hadron Collider mm -hmm. and the discovery of the Higgs boson. Mm -hmm. But now I've invited you to give you a slightly different theme talk about Einstein, mm -hmm. Times mm -hmm. Magazine of the Century is what yeah. they're calling it. So can you please talk about well, that? Well, it, it, it's coming? a sort of history of um, a very important turning point in physics. By the end of the 19th century, people seriously thought physics was at an end, we could explain everything. There were, there were just a few clouds on the horizon that people didn't quite understand, but they thought, oh, it'll all be fixed up in five or ten years. Mm. But starting with Planck's um, discovery mm. of um, how to explain the spectrum of black body radiation, if you heat up a solid object, it gives off electromagnetic radiation with a range of energies, a range of colours, 
And that wasn't understood. That was one of these little clouds on the horizon. Mm. And Planck um, successfully explained that by introducing this idea of quantization, that you can't have any energy you like in an atom or a molecule, that it comes in fixed amounts. Um, and then Einstein, 1905, um, continued that idea, showed that um, photons, electromagnetic radiation, come in, in little bumps, little parcels or quanta, um, that, that uh, we nowadays call photons. Um, but he also published two other um, mold-breaking, I suppose you'd call them, uh, ideas in the same year, 1905. Um, he explained um, the Brownian motion, which is if you have very small particles, perhaps particles of, uh, of um, uh, pollen yeah. suspended in a liquid, they jiggle about all the time. And the, the, act, the, the, the motion wasn't fully understood, couldn't calculate how much they moved about until Einstein showed. And in showing that, he had to assume that the material that they were suspended in, the liquid, whether it's water, is made of molecules. Yeah. Now, up to that time, chemists believed in molecules because it explains um, why uh, elements combine together always in the same ratio. Um, but the physicists weren't convinced. They said, show us a molecule or let us measure the size of a molecule. Um, uh, so a nice mathematical idea, but do they really exist? We don't know. But Einstein was able to show how to calculate the size of a molecule or alternatively, how many molecules are in a certain uh, mass of material, what we call Avogadro's number. People were able to measure it based on, on Einstein's results. So, so the physicist then believed in atoms and molecules. Um, well, didn't we always believe there exist atoms? I mean, the Greeks came up with the word atom, didn't they? Or? But there was no proof. There was no... No, 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 no proof. Although, as I said, there were hints, certainly in chemistry, um, in a branch of physics called uh, the kinetic theory of gases understanding how a gas exerts a pressure on the walls in terms of the molecules bouncing off the walls. But it says nothing about the, s the size, the mass of the molecules, or how many there are in a given volume. It was only through Einstein's work that we were able to, uh, to measure that. In fact, um, French physicist Jean Perrin, um, shortly afterwards, made a very accurate measurement using this result. And he got the Nobel Prize for the measurement um, Einstein got his Nobel Prize for um, the photoelectric effect showing the existence of photons. But in the same year, 1905, he also published um, the first paper on what we can now call special relativity, um, showing that the speed of light is the same for all observers. Um, and, and so th those, those three significant developments, um, uh, d the existence of molecules, the, the particle nature of light. Everybody knew that light behaved as waves, but to show it behaved as particles as well um, was, well, mind-blowing really. Um, and also special relativity, those, those three big advances all made in the same year. Ma made by a guy um, working in the Swiss patent office. As a, <laughs> as a, a patent officer, patent examiner, third class. All right. third, class. <laughs> third class. After he published these papers, he was promoted to second class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But shortly afterwards, he moved and got a professorship. I think it was in. I think it was in Zurich. I think you also be talking about the time the war. The war was going on at that time as well. <laughs> when he was born in 1879, what was the world like? Germany had only just been formed out of a number of different oh, right. states. I've even found out what was going on in Australia in oh, 1879. Right. Um, Ned Kelly robbed a bank in New South <laughs> Wales, but I think probably any year uh, around there you could say that Ned Kelly robbed a bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On this sort of wave nature of light and versus particle nature of light, we now come to the conclusion that it's both, depending on how we observe it. I mean, what is light? Is that still a, sort of a fundamental question that physicists need to try and answer against, do you think? Well, um, the, a number of people have tried explanations, um, but the one that most physicists work on is called shut up and calculate. <laughs> it means, okay, we're confused, we know that light can sometimes behave as a wave, sometimes behave as a particle, but we know how to do the calculations. We can make predictions, we can measure them. Um, so, um, 
It, it goes back actually to the time of Newton, when Newton introduced gravity and the inverse square law. People said, well, you know, what's really going on? Um, and he said, hypotheses non fingo. I don't deal with hypotheses. I can calculate the inverse square law, so that the moon um, is feeling exactly the same force of gravity as the apple falling to the ground, just further away. Um, so it, it goes back to the time of Newton. Uh, shut up and calculate. <laughs> <laughs> but surely there will come a time when the, you can't calculate anymore. We've sort of exhausted all calculations that we have to rethink what, what is actually... Yes. I, I mean, I think the, the, the problem is trying to explain the microscopic world in terms of everyday particles and waves. That's why I like to say it isn't a particle, it isn't a wave, it's light, it's photons. <laughs> it's a different thing It's altogether. a different thing, yes, and, yeah. and uh, uh, other things behave in the same way, so um, uh, all particles behave both as waves and as, and as particles. In fact, we shouldn't really call them particles. The classical particle, of course, mm. is a point-like object at a particular point in space, whereas a wave spreads out over all space. Um, we should call our subject not elementary particle physics, but elementary wavicle physics. But everybody would laugh at us. Yeah. So we actually redefine the word particle to mean these strange objects that can exert, the ex that can show both behaviors. Very fascinating stuff. So, well, thank you very much, Dr. Vincent Smith, for your time in um, having you here. And also looking forward to your public talk on Friday, May 23rd, of yes. 2014. Thank My you very pleasure. much. Thank My pleasure. Much.